before we get into this episode, there's something that might be of interest that I wanted to tell you about. Seen and Heard, who uh, run this podcast, have been asked by Scotland Food and Drink to undertake a strategic review of the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards. Now, these Excellence Awards have been going for almost 20 years and are a huge mainstay of the food and drink sector. But it's time to ensure that they're still relevant. So if you have ever been involved in the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards, or even if you've ever had an opinion about them, we would love for you, please, to complete our survey. So if you go to the On Farm Twitter, which is at on underscore farm uk and click the link in the bio there will be a tab in there that will take you to the survey and it should only take you a very short while to complete but we would be enormously grateful so i'm looking for a lot of a lot of frond yeah because that we need that straight bit Uh uh-huh not any thicker than a pencil not any thicker than a pencil a lot of frond and yep fine fine so hi, it's Monty here for this episode of On Farm. And we've come up all the way, well I've come up from the borders via picking up producer Dave in Edinburgh and we're here on the Invercauld estate just outside Braemar for an exercise in heather harvesting, heather picking. Something that I'm just completely, I don't know, I don't know, we've never, never been involved in anything like this before. And we're here courtesy of our friends at Bell Ingram. Not only are they um, part of a project here, their architectural team are overseeing the restoration work at Braemar Castle and some other historic buildings here on the estate, but also the Bell Ingram team, the wider team, are here on a team building exercise to pick heather, harvest heather, fill that big eye for William's trailer over there, and we've got a team of expert thatchers who are going to thatch the heather onto a roof. All very interesting, all traditional crafts. Usually when we do on farm, I try and come across as quite knowledgeable, and I hopefully do, but in this, it's all new. The whole thing about heather picking is you need to find out what it is we're looking for and then be able to locate it in the in the field there, because it's not all usable. But we're looking for stuff a bit like this. So pull a wee bit out. That would be, if we can get lots of stuff just like that, we'll be able to thatch well with it. I'm Brian Wilson and I'm the thatcher for the project. I specialise in kind of traditional thatch styles, heather and bracken and so on. So heather thatch is, heather itself's not particularly waterproof, but if you can get it, enough of it on and it's straight running and it's squeezed tight enough together, it will shed water. So it goes on the roof like that with the, the fronds hanging down so you build up a thickness of it and that's what's taking the weather and, and dripping off. And when it's working well, only the outer layer gets wet and the under, underside stays dry. So we need really good quality straight running heather. And when you get a, roughly that amount of it in a pile, which will take two of you possibly a couple of hours to get, we'll come and bundle it and take it away. And we're looking for about 60 or 70 bundles about that size. Okay, so if... Not today, but... <laughs> well, if we do, we can all go home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go and... I've got a whole load of gardening gloves in the car, so I'm going to go... It is go quite hard in the hands, yeah. It's going to be quite tough. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Yeah, that's what we're saying. My arms are going to be right. agony. Right, sure. <laughs> Okay, have a go, and uh, it's going to be hot and physical, so stop quite often and get a drink, and we'll be fine. What are we looking at? Heather stems of about, I don't know, 60, 70 centimetres long, nice and straight, and pulling them out of the ground and forming them into bundles. Um, we're just kind of wading through some heather that's probably not anywhere near the length to go and look for what is um, more appropriate. And that's another, another good bit. So as you pull these, find a clean bit of ground, just lay, <coughs> lay them always the same way around, so you're not kind of jumbling up the, the bundle, always the same way around. And uh, you'll find that you've got to move around between uh, handfuls. <clears throat> Try not to lose what you've already picked, because it's very easy to, to leave it lying behind. So just in terms of what we're looking at here, I mean, we're, this is May time, but can we harvest heather all year round for the job? or? 
<laughs> yeah, well, you can use quite a lot of the year. In the winter, it's, it's a bit brittle. Right. And it's also unpleasant for working. Yeah. But um, this is a good time of year for it, right up until about late July, early August, and then it's in flower. Yeah, you, you can still pick it when it's in flower, but the, the flowers tend to die and clog up the thatch. From from your point of view, I mean, obviously you do this. You're 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 a professional thatcher. This is what you do. But do you also get involved in this kind of exercise with a team like this of of kind of willing volunteers to? Well, not not often enough. We we would normally do this kind of picking for a, a new thatch with a team of uh, paid contractors, right. really. So right. people people will pick heather on piecework. Right. That tends to be also quite a sociable event, yeah. but. Uh, yeah. People are more focused on just you know head down and work, and it is a, a hard day's work. Yeah, so we'll see how these um, how these ones stack up against yeah. paid contractors. No reason why this shouldn't work just as well. But. <laughs> right, how are you doing? Let's have a wee look at this because. Oh gosh. Well, are you learning? Have you got it? Have you got it? Sussed? Do you think I've got it? <laughs> have a look at the pile. <laughs> it's yeah. I'm not quite sure. It's one of these things where you think you've got a really good pile, and then probably not. So my name is Louise Finney, uh, so I'm a graduate land agent. Based been with Perth? Or? Yeah, based out of Perth. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I've been with the company, just picking up for two years now, uh, sitting my exams in November. This is very different, because this, this is not um, your usual day in the life of a land agent, this is not your usual phone calls and, no, and meetings not. and laptops. This is, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a tremendous office for the day, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah, I love it. This is the main reason why I love the job. It's fantastic. Every day is different, especially when you can get to the office and come to, you know, places like this. And it's, it's fantastic. It's brilliant. And are you going to have a good bundle by the end of the day? Oh, well, we'll wait and see. <laughs> I wouldn't bargain on it. <laughs> have you got the eye in yet to actually um, see what you're looking for? Maybe for pulling up the straight bits, but then you pull them up and it's not going to front on the end, so... What do you mean by fronds on the end? Oh, they've got to have these, they've got to be green on the end, so like the bits that are roll down. <laughs> just brown and dead at the end aren't any use. So all this frond on the end, because that's what sh sheds the water, is that, yeah. what, is that what I picked up when yeah, I was listening? Yeah, that's the theory. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's not clean. I got a row for not cleaning it. So it's Alison, is that right? Alison, yes. Um, Alison Mulvihill. Um, I work for Pipelines Utilities Department. So is this, this is not your normal day to day? No, <laughs> it's not often they let me out. <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a bundle forming anyway, but you've got 60 or 70 bundles to, 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 to form, haven't you? I didn't actually realise it was so hard to pull it out. Um, but it's a learning curve. Yeah. For yeah. some reason we all had a vision that we'd have little... Knives. Scythes to cut. Scythes. So it would just be... Snip, snip, just cut them yeah. off, be fine. Right, right, just right. take anything, but no, right. it's a bit more okay. involved. <laughs> but it's good. Get two or three strands together. Yeah. And then that's hard to pull out. Yes. You twist it a wee bit so it's easier to grip it. Oh. And then tug. Ah. And if it doesn't come that way, tug just slightly the other way. Ah, you've got the neck. Right, we're not doing the twisting, and, and that's do that problem. Along there, along there, yeah. along there. Along there, right. And then that's, that's decent. Decent so stuff. most of that will be decent. Yeah. Well, so you just pull walk it down the hill. It, uh, it weakens the ground, then you can kind of... Yeah, right. Good. So what percentage of your work is heather thatching then? Or? Well, thatching in general is probably about half of my, my work, and it varies from year to year. But it, we'll specialise in, in traditional Scottish styles of thatching, uh, using materials like bracken and heather and uh, marram grass and so on. Sometimes reeds as well, because reeds were produced on the tay, and some Scottish thatch is, is reed thatching. But it, it, even then, it's a different style from, you know, southern thatching. We're trying to preserve the, the ways that it was done in Scotland, which is not just the materials, but some of the fixings as well. Right. And uh, at the moment, that makes up about half of my work. Is it is it a, a kind of a dying thing then, or are you... Well, it is, unfortunately, yeah. <clears throat> There's probably two or maybe three of us in Scotland who would be able and willing to do this kind of work now. But it would be great if there was a, a few up-and-coming interested... Cause, because the work's out there, is it? Obviously, if you're <coughs> getting busy, the work's out there. The, the work's out there is probably not ever going to be the equivalent of being like an English village thatcher where you might be doing the same kind of work all year, every yeah. year. Yeah. The, the guys down there are very, very busy and you know they're very good at what they do. They do the same thing day in and day out. 
but here I think any anybody interested in thatching would need to combine that with doing some other kind of work yeah. and being a bit flexible over the, yeah. the work time. Especially with weather considerations. Yes, there's yeah. weather. And, yeah. there, and there really aren't that many thatched buildings. You know, hopefully people will become interested again. There'll be newer, newer uses for these old skills. But at the moment it's repairing a lot of traditional buildings that are dwindling. Brian, how did you get into this line of work? Uh, gradually working on uh, crook frame buildings. Stonework was what I was interested in to begin with. But we began to realise that to repair these full buildings you needed to... Combine that with working on timber and turf and, and thatch. So pretty much uh, learning from scratch. And then I worked for a few years with a traditional thatcher in Kintail, uh, Duncan Stalker, Duncan Matheson, who was probably the best of his generation of uh, the traditional thatchers. But up until that time, it would have been passed down within families, you know, father to son. Uh, of course, very that, uh, much a family following, a family trade, basically. Yes, it would yep. have been, but I think I think at one time it would have also not been a special trade. You know, a lot of people would have done their own thatching, little yep. bits of yep. repair yep. to their own houses yep. and barns and yep. so on. It wouldn't have been a mystical no. skill or no. craft. No. Uh, some people would have been good at it and others it's not so good. funny you use that word mystical because that's how you kind of, it's like kind of how we think about these traditional things now, yeah. isn't it? But from your point of view, it's what you do, you, 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 you've picked it up and, you know, if more people would, would learn it, it's a, it's a, it's yeah. a trade. It's a trade and it's a craft, yeah. but it's one of these things that y- you obey certain principles and rules and you stick to those and you've got a thatched roof. Yeah. It's n- there's nothing more to it than that. And of course, the more you do of it, the, the better you become at it, the better your eye for d- certain detail mm-hmm. will be. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the skill in it is knowing what to collect, like what we're doing today, is knowing how to get the, the good material. And if you get a set of good material, that's the basis of a good, a good thatch. So Brian made it look like, yeah, if you start there and work your way down, but I don't see a bit, maybe there, does that look old kind of uniform? It doesn't look long enough, does it? Yeah. Well, further up the hill, there's some longer bits, right at the top. That green there. Yeah, you think it's long enough, but it's not. It's just higher up the hill. Uh-huh. And then that... He's dead. Yeah, is that that's too thick, isn't it? And dead. And dead. <laughs> this bit here. Oh, no, that might be okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Just another half a ton of those. Half a ton of that. <laughs> Do you see the size of that trailer we've got to fill? Yeah, a big 14-foot Ivor Williams. Right, so I've got one piece from here. I climbed it quite high up this bank to get one piece, and that's no use. Look at that. But so maybe. It's completely getting the eye in job. He was twisting. He was twisting a kind handfuls. of clump together, wasn't he? That's a good bit. Yeah, this is a good bit actually. A twist. Right. Now, I'm going to start on the outside and work our way down the hill. Right. No, it's just too far up the hill now. A good bit of greenery on the top. Yeah, the and, yeah, and the greenery sheds the water. So all of this structural stuff is to do the thatching, and then at the end of it, the bit that the water hits are these fronts. How are you, Ian? Unaccustomed to hard work. Unaccustomed to hard work. Are you not feeling enthused by the fact you're all your colleagues are out here to do the hard work too, though? I, I'm, I'm more enthused when I'm w- sitting back watching them work hard. That, that's, that's what enthuses me. That nice. sounds, sounds awful, doesn't it? That's, no, no I'm, be, I'm being facetious. No, this was my bright idea yeah. to volunteer yeah, the yeah. team. Yeah, so but... I've, I've kind of got to pitch in. I'm Ian Cram, I'm a partner with Bell Ingram and I head up the architectural and building surveying and planning team. Give us a bit of an idea of your involvement here, what's going on, why you've got the team here, you know, what's the, the, the wider picture of Bell Ingram's involvement on the estate here? We are the conservation architects responsible for the restoration of Braemar Castle. We are looking after the compliance side and making sure that the conservation is done in accordance with all the various rules and regulations for conservation work. 
and which is a pretty big job because let's face it, I mean it's it's a it's a castle and it's it's a, it's, it's a great air listed yeah. building of historical significance. I think its four hundredth birthday is in twenty eight. Okay. So we're not far from its four hundredth birthday. So um, it would be nice to have everything just absolutely shipshape in time. So there's a lot of effort gone in, a lot of fundraising gone in on the part of the Community Trust. So a huge amount of work behind the scenes and we get to come in and help to deliver it, Mm -hmm. which is a great privilege. I can imagine you guys are busy with architectural projects, you know, all over the country, etc. But as you say, a 400-year-old castle, A-listed, such a prominent position at Braemar there, with the whole community backing, and they want to make the most of it, a great project to be involved in. Oh, yes, it's it's lovely. We'd, we don't get these every day, uh, so we like to make the most of it. And when the call went out for, well, we've got to rethatch the fog house, and we've got a thatcher lined up, but we need some heather. Um, we need some volunteers. Um, it, I wouldn't say it was a no-brainer, but uh, my mouth was open before my brain was engaged, and I said, Bell Ingram will provide the, the labour for picking the heather. And 130 people, I thought, there's a good chance of me getting a decent squad. And to be perfectly honest, we were oversubscribed with volunteers. So uh, we've got a. We were asked for half a dozen folk, and we've got. A fair number today and tomorrow and the day after. And the, the idea being that Bellingham team, all these volunteers, will harvest the heather. And this is completely different from your professional involvement. This is just getting this is just getting boots on the ground, this, isn't it? Really, this is just manual labour. Yep. So yes, it is um, a, a sufficiently skilled job that we've got to be taught how to do it before we start. Oh, so you've yeah. been through that. Yep. Then it just needs people that are willing to listen and do what they're told. So. I am, so I thought everybody else will be. <laughs> Obviously, you're here because of your involvement and you've, 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 as you say, volunteered, but, you know, to sell it to your colleagues, it, it must provide some benefits. It's a team-building exercise, isn't it? Well, the sun's shining. The sun is shining. The forecast was for drizzle, and I thought, am I going to get people to come? But they came anyway, and lo and behold, the sun's shining, so it's great. It's good to just get out and do something completely different. We're a diverse organisation with lots of different disciplines and skills, so it's nice to just mix people up and put them in a on a patch of heather and get them working together. It's also good from my point of view because it gets the heather thatch on the roof and ultimately we're responsible for making that happen. (laughs) So it was quite important to us at a professional level. We've come down from the heather picking and uh, we're actually walking up the drive towards the castle, Braemar Castle. There's a massive amount of work still going on. It's a scaffold clad at the moment and it's all nice, proper lime-rendered harling to allow the old stone building to breathe and it's being painted a lovely cream colour and the castle's just going to look wonderful in this landscape when the scaffolding is down. But the focus of today's efforts and the heather picking is to rethatch the roof of this little building in the grounds called the Fog House. Brian the Thatcher's having a look and Ian the architect and it's all... It's a little simple timber building with um, all the thatch stripped off the roof as it stands. Big nails, big six, eight inch nails all over the roof, which I'm guessing, I'm guessing is where the the thatch is tied to. This is a sort of, uh, not a folly, but a pavilion kind of building. Um, they were they were popular from Victorian times onwards, called fog, fog houses. Right. Uh, and they tend to be an annex to a big house or a, or a castle, a kind of a place to sit out yep. and have a peaceful, you know, quiet, meditative time sitting yep. on a, under a thatched roof. Uh, nice to look at, a nice sort of garden feature, if you like. We reckon it might have been thatched 20 or 30 years ago. But that, uh, maximum. with these nails and things, that's 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 not how you're going to do it. You're going to do it more, what more of a traditional way? It's slightly more traditional. I mean, this is not a traditional building. It's a, a Victorian folly style yep. building. So you're trying to to make it's a cosmetic thatch really, but we'll fix it on in more of a traditional way, which is horizontal banding fixings. Okay. Tensioning things in horizontal layers, and the fixings will be hidden. There won't be nails. Uh, 
projecting down through the, the roof layer like that. So it, it'll remain more waterproof than this one would have. Do you think that's maybe been a cheats way of doing it? And big nails are going to take the water through them anyway. Exactly. Not? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been a quick way of putting on right. thatch. It's done its job. Yeah. Yeah. So you so you've got the tower scaffold just now. You you're going to gather the bundles of heather. Talk us through what happens next. Well, we'll put on an eaves layer that overhangs everything that you can see and, and joins the roof, hangs it over onto where the walls are and Which kind of projects shed, sheds a bit. the water, right? Shed the water yeah, further yeah, out than yeah. the walls and protect these walls quite a yeah. bit. It'd be like a mushroom uh -huh. uh, right. effect. And then from that eaves layer, we'll come up in a cone to finish up at the finial, uh, up at the top, where there's a, an apex and a, a slightly ornamental finish on the top. And, and generally how thick... Do you go? We, we would go generally 10 inches to a foot thick, okay. but this, as I say, is, is more of a cos cosmetic, kind yep. of ornamental building. Yep. So it doesn't need that, and we'll probably go more like 6, six or 8 inches thick on this one. And it'll be greenish to begin with, and then very quickly go olive and then brown and finish up grey. And do you have your own take on decorative topping out no we're, no. we're going to reuse the decorative ah, top right okay uh, right it's here it's just a carved wooden yep a uh, finial for the yep. top with a lead uh apron i suppose so the, le it. the lead apron will sit on top of the thatch and mm -hmm. then that finial goes on and that's yeah, yeah so yep. i need to finish my thatch to come up underneath that lead apron yep. which, which gives me the diameter it needs to be up at yep. the, the top yep. Yep. so i just keep thatching upwards until it reaches that diameter mm -hmm. bung the top plunk that on the top and Yep. And go home. <laughs> <laughs> How long is that going to take? A Once week. you've got this heather bundled up? If I, if I have a lot of heather this week, it'll take us a week to put right, it on. Right. And five days to put it on. Yep. Oh, very good. I thought it would be a much longer project than that. No, it's, this is a really quite a small building. Uh, it is, know, yeah. yeah. It, yeah. E even the diameter around the eaves, like, that'll be slow doing the eaves, but then every foot you go upwards, it's, it's just diminishing. It'll be quite quick towards the end. And what a spot. I, yeah, I was going to say, I guess this is going to be, you know, you can just see this being used if the castle's booked up for, a, you know, a wedding or something like that. A lovely spot to come and have photographs taken or whatever, and even in there if it's raining. and Smoker's corner. Yeah, thing. yeah. It's just a peaceful place to sit or yeah, have a party, yeah. or maybe a kind of romantic place even. Well, if yeah, you sit in there yeah. just now, there's little yeah. bits of graffiti and people's names. And right. Can we go in? Are we allowed in? Absolutely, yeah, oh. yeah. As you sit there... Oh. It's absolutely stunning. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely been built for the view. There's very little in the way of archive information on the Fog House. Found two, maybe three references to it in the historical archives. There are other Fog Houses around on other estates. The view from it is absolutely stunning. You go and you sit in the Fog House and you go, Ah, that's why they built it here. <laughs> it was the castle is a defensive structure. Mm -hmm. The fog house is garden ornamenture, yep. and it is a very potentially pretty little piece, but it's looking very, very tired and forlorn at the moment. Uh, in desperate need of some tender, loving care. What you're looking at there is modern graffiti. In the castle, we have Hanoverian graffiti from the bar when, it, when the Hanoverian garrisons were barracked in right. the castle they scratched their names in the glass and messages to loved ones whereas here we have more 20th century yeah, graffiti this goes, I'm, I'm saying goes back to 2009 <laughs> that's a 2015 2009 well Connor yeah. Smith was here in 2009 oh, yeah. uh, 2011 Shout out to Connor Smith, Smith if yeah. you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> and Matthew W. And Nick Geddes was here in 1987. That's not Hanoverian, but that's as old <laughs> as I've found so far. A little bit older. Yeah. We're coming to the end of this episode of On Farm. There's just time to head back up the hill to see how the Bellingham team of heather pickers are getting on. Remember, this is just day one of three days. In total, Brian Wilson the Thatcher reckons they will need to gather 60 arm full sized bundles to have enough to do the thatching job. They seem to be getting on alright. <laughs> one picking, one throwing, one stacking. <laughs> that's, that's a good way to do it actually. Let's just look at this. This looks good. This looks like a good bit you've got here. Yeah, I think it is. I've just got most of a bundle down there. It's just looking a little bit skinny so we just need a little bit more to go on top and then uh, that'll be bundle number six. 
Chris, how are you finding your day? Yeah, it's good. It's actually my first day at Bellingham. I haven't done a day in the office yet, so this is my my first day uh, picking heather. This is day one on day the job. One. Never All right. Done a day in the office, so this is very good. And is this is this a novel approach to architecture? Uh, for me, yes. Yeah. Um, I haven't done a bit harder than you were expecting. Yeah, basically. I've uh, I've sweated on. Yeah, I've had some stressful days sweating, but not not physically uh, sweating picking heather. heather yes. Yeah. And are you quite confident that after the three days this lot are going to have the heather you need? I think uh, there's every chance that they'll get a load of good stuff, but it might, it might take longer than it would with a yes, professional course. squad. Yeah. Yeah. But it's great because you've got this, this number of people who are then invested in, in the building. You yeah. know, they've got a, a part of it for the next 20 years is yeah. theirs. We will have to revisit Brave Our Castle one day soon to see how the project all finished up. It was really fascinating to speak to Brian Wilson, one of just a handful of traditional Scottish thatchers plying a trade. So thank you very much, Brian. And thanks also to architect Ian Cram and the team at Bellingham for inviting us along for the day. If you've not heard our episode prior to this one in the On Farm podcast feed, go and give that a listen. More chat there about the restoration of Braemar Castle and particularly the community effort that's gone into raising the money to get the work done. Your usual reminder, this on-farm podcast and all in the series are brought to you by our team at Seen and Heard PR and Marketing. And this episode is with the kind support of Bellingham. Seen and Heard and the on-farm team are here for a chat anytime you have any PR, comms or marketing needs. We'll see you next time for an episode recorded at the Five Show. That's it from me and bye for now.